two, one. Good day, everybody. Welcome to today's uh, Community Services Committee meeting. Uh, it is April 26th, and today on our committee, we have uh, Councillors Berg, Councillor Bosch, myself as chair, and Mayor Clayton will be arriving here in a bit. Got a couple orders of business, but first things first, uh, I'll need a motion to go in camera. Councillor Bosch. I move to go in camera. That motion is in order. I'll call it to question. All in favor? Ooh. Right, and that motion passes and... Uh
Okay, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your patience online and in person here. Uh, looks like chamber is just filling right now. We got our in-camera business taking care of. The item that we were talking about in camera was in regards to a 10-year lease for the East Link Center uh, renewed by Second Cup Canada uh, for uh, that 10-year lease inside the East Link Center. So for that, I'll just look around for a motion or any comments or questions to administration in regards to this and we'll go from there but councillor boss said she has a motion and all ready to go thank you chair Thiessen. um having you know these little kiosks in in east link i think is you know what everybody expects and values and second cup has done a good job in the past so we look forward to to them being there uh for the next 10 years so I move committee recommend council direct administration to enter into a 10 year lease agreement with Second Cup Coffee Canada for the operation of the coffee kiosk located at the East Link Center. That motion's in order. Thank you for that uh, introduction as well, uh, Councillor Bosch. I'll look around council and committee for any questions or comments. And seeing none, uh, I think we discussed this thoroughly. Uh, call the question. Councillor Berg's in favor. And that motion carries. Thank you very much, everyone. And now to our regular scheduled business. Uh, opening right up, we have what, one delegation uh, from the Grand Prairie Regional Sport Connection. So I know that they're here today and ready to come in and uh, sit at our table for, for a quick presentation on our community group funding and how that impacts the Sport Connection. So I just welcome you to the presenter's table and please do uh, introduce yourselves. I'm sure we all know who you are, but for the people watching at home and our new councillors uh, who might not know, uh, welcome. Great. Um, oh, turn it on. Test, test. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. My name is Karna Germscheid. I'm the executive director of the Grand Prairie Regional Sport Connection. Uh, I do have to say, I th uh, this is a bit of a different format than we're used to. I thought we'd be at this table. So I was actually going to send out a handout so you guys wouldn't have to stare at me as I was doing my presentation, but I certainly don't have enough, but uh, we'll get through it, I think. And I'll let Lee introduce himself. You want to show us your handout? Just put it on that um, clear template there, and then everyone will see it on their screen. Hey, thanks. Uh, my name is Lee Goldie, and I'm chair of the uh, Grand Prairie Regional Sport Connection. And uh, we're really happy to be here today to report on 2021. Uh, we, of course, had a, an interesting year, as did everyone else, uh, with COVID, but. Uh, just really uh, happy to report that we have a, a strong organization. I think we're doing good work in the community. Uh, we certainly uh, have talked to all of you uh, sometime about the value of sport in the community. We really believe strongly in that. And we think that the Sport Connection is doing a good job in, in promoting sport and connections and communica uh, communicating, advocating for sport. and. Uh, so the, uh, we're very appreciative of the, the funding and the support that we get uh, from the council and also from, uh, from the county as well. Uh, it's a nice partnership. Uh, we've got a very strong staff and in 2021, even though things weren't, uh, didn't go as they normally do, uh, our staff was able to support various sport organizations in the community and help them through COVID. Uh, they don't have resources that, that we might have. And in addition, we were able to continue with our, our regular events, that, uh, things like Try It Day and our uh, sports awards banquet where we, we recognize uh, people in the community. So, so it was a, a busy year despite COVID and, um, and a good productive year for us. And so we're, uh, uh, you know, I think we're you know, coming out of COVID now and getting back to the normal events and, and busier than ever as we uh, move into 2022. But so what I'd like to do is turn it over to Karna and she will just uh, highlight some of the, the activities that we had in 2021. Thank you. 
All right, so the Grand Prairie Regional Sport Connection is um, directed by a board of directors. Um, we run by our strategic directions, which is community service, advocacy, and education. So anything that we do falls within those pillars of, uh, uh, for our organization. So this is just for visuals for um, these kind of ma this macro report on some of our signature events. One thing that's really important to us is um, participation in sport, and um, one of our pillars is service to cre and one of the that is to create opportunities for residents to experience sport. And one of our signature events that we host every year is the Try It Day event. Try It Day event went from one time annually to two time annually in in 2019 so in 2021 our two events one was online did we get participation in sport organizations absolutely we did but of course that participation number was lower in the online though we did get 11 of our organizations come out and put together videos that what we promoted one good thing and some wins from this one is that the media mentions were still really high for this event and um, some of our KPIs came through in that people were watching up to 50 minutes of those videos, which really says a lot about the event. Our try it day in September 2011 was our first um, in-person try it day since COVID, and it went really well. We had 597 registrations. Um, activities that different sport organizations that participated was 26 different sport um, organizations offering 35 different activities. The, the great thing about Try It Day is that um, we send out surveys after to both the sport organizations and the parents and the guardians to get feedback because we wouldn't be hosting this event if, if we did not meet our objectives. Our objectives for this event is to um, increase sport participation and increase the exposure of sport. So it's really important for our sport organizations, especially post-COVID, to increase their membership. Um, and that is one of the roles that we play with hosting this event. Another one of our signature events is Northwest Alberta Sport Excellence Awards. Last year, or not last, yeah, last year in 2021, we had to host it online. I think a lot of the councillors that, um, and the mayor from last year did, did participate online. Very different format, of course. We would prefer to have it in person, but even for that one, um, we ended up with uh, 25 different nominees from 17 different organizations. This awards is an opportunity and a service to our sport community so that they can feed into this event to celebrate and recognize their athletes, their coaches, their volunteers. And um, it was no different last year, even though in 2020, if you guys recall, most championships were, were canceled. We were expecting a lot lower numbers, but what we know from this is that people were out there grinding and people still needed a service in order to um, uplift and highlight their, um, their great people. A bonus out of this is that we are connected by TELUS and uh, we actually were, um, were part of a one hour episode that was posted on TELUS about the sport in our community. It highlighted our event. And what they did is they, they hired local videographers to attend these awards and they actually participated with some of our award winners with their families and their baskets, so they were watching their awards. So we did have really wonderful engagement, even though it was an online event. And we are recognized, they did approach us um, with no uh, reach out or anything, so this does show that we are recognized in the community as um, a, a connector. Another pillar is education. In 2021, we're kind of actually straddling a couple of years here, but YQU Sport for All is an initiative that is funded through Make a Diff Sport Grant. And what it is is because the Sport Connection recognized that there's a big gap in offering after school sports for a lot of our schools. We did a principal survey at the end of 2020, and the feedback was that um, we aren't offering what we could be offering because we're over capacity. And, um, Kids, um, kids can't participate because a lot of our kids need to get home after sports, so they depend on those 
buses for transportation. So even if we offered it, a lot of our students, because their parents are working and can't get off, need to get home safely after school. Recognizing that the school board plays a significant role in our sport participation in the region, um, we wanted to partner with the with a pilot project, and we did so with the Grand Prairie um, Public School Division, and we've identified four low so lower social economic schools to partner with to offer this multi-sport after-school programming, which includes transportation. It is a pilot project, but what we're doing with this initiative is we're trying to find a formula that can work so that schools that are with teachers that are over capacity and families that need to get their kids home after school can find a way to get their children participating in sport because that is a major gap in our region. And currently we are running these sessions, so I'll have more to report in my interim reports for these ones as well. Um, oh, sorry, and I should have said with the YQU as far as the education piece, um, quality programming, so programming um, needs to be high quality. So we don't want to just roll out programming and that is actually a problem with, with the sports system is that there's no regulations in sport, right? So we want to make sure that the we were training coaches, but also we want to engage new coaches and invigorate more coaches because coaches are also a gap within, it, within the region. So we identified and hired, I would say, 18 coaches through this program and help pay for their training. So the the agreement was is these coaches would onboard, we would offer them free training, and in turn, they would get hands-on experience coaching these after-school programs. So that's another role that this plays, but education for 2021 was a big, big thing that we were still able to, to do through the pandemic, which I think is a major success. Advocacy, so a role that the Sport Connection plays is is advocating the benefits of sport in the region. We advocate for our region also provincially. So we make sure that we create relationships with sport leaders, whether it's through the, uni uh, the university, the, for the government of Alberta, whether it's sport leaders that are part of provincial sport organizations, because what we know is that this region sometimes gets forgotten unless somebody's at the table. So we make sure that we're at the table and sit as sit with as many sport leadership groups as we, we can provincially. Um, we also advocate to yourselves, so you guys would recall um, some of you when we did um, updates on COVID and what does that mean for our sport organizations? Keeping a, um, keeping a pulse on what's going on in the sport community is part of the role that we play and advocating for those organizations is something that we do regularly with not only yourselves, but other politicians. We meet with provincial politicians. We also do presentations regularly for the Rotary groups that I know some of you have also seen. And then I just wanted to wrap this 10 minutes up with saying that no matter what we do, we're making sure that we're aligning with our funders. That is our top priority. Every single year we meet in September to do our strategic directives and we make sure that we align. And how we align with your strategic objectives is through community. So we're helping you foster those connections. We are an arm's length organization that is helping you guys create good customer service for our sport community. Um, the economy piece is we all know and we, we value that sport is a driver of economy in our region. When we have stronger sport community, not only do we have better and healthier citizens, but we have stronger organizations that can then have better events more often. And that's part of the big picture as well. And then the governance piece is you guys can't be everywhere we take the sport and recreation piece and we make those connections and we represent this region and we try to re represent it as best as we can through the provincial government as well as those provincial leaders um, and national le leaders and partnerships as well. Um, I would just like to thank my board of directors. Um, I'm very grateful, it's a great leadership team. Um, we have Lee and we have um, Julia who's our vice. She's the chair at, for the Kinesi department out at, um, at GPRC or Northwestern Polytechnic, excuse me. And actually, she helped us leverage this grant through Make a Diff with the YQU Sport for All program in that 
her students, not only are a lot of our coaches, but her students are actually doing the methodology piece so that we can report back to our funders in hopes that we can bring another 50,000 into the region to host these types of after school programming. So that's a great partnership and something that um, is very important for our organization. Um, Garrett's with Alberta Health Services, Health Promotions, a gr great leader in our organization. Melanie is a um, sport volunteer. She also works with health, uh, um, Alberta Health Services in procurement. We have um, Christine Rollins, who's the management at, with the County of Grand Prairie. Jeff Smith, who's actually the head coach of SIT, SIT Canada Volleyball. He's a great resource for us locally as a local volunteer as well. Mike Lozon is a principal with the Peace Wapiti School Division. Great, he was able to get us um, more pr principals and contacts than I would ever have been able to without him being on the board. Um, we have um, Tyrone Pike, who's a local business owner and volunteer, uh, sport volunteer as well. Kurt um, Balderson, which as you know is with the uh, county council as a counselor and an avid sportsman himself. Stacey Boning, who also actually, she was a good contact with the Sport Connection before she was even a counselor out at Town Access Smith. She is um, a real driver when it comes to sport volunteerism in the Sexsmith area. And then counselor Wendy Bosch, who's your, your peer and um, some administration, which you guys would be very familiar with. So I did want to say that because it is a powerhouse team, in my opinion, and they do do a lot of work, and I am very grateful to them, as I am to you guys. Um, our organization wouldn't exist, and I believe that um, it is a great service for, for the region, and it's a great way to help leverage what the good, what the, community the good work that the community is doing. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Germshy and Mr. Goldie. I appreciate the presentation and uh, your thoroughness, your dedication, your passion to sports, um, your, your leadership and advocacy, and, um, and living out your purpose. I remember when you were just a small, small organization and trying to find your wings in council. Uh, and the City of Grand Prairie worked together in partnership to help you there. And I'm so proud of a lot of the good work that you're doing in introducing sports to our community, to young and old. So thank you very much to you and your powerhouse team, and thanks for the presentation today. I think I had Councillor O'Connor or Councillor Berg? Councillor Berg. Thank you, Chair Thiessen, and thank you, Karna and Lee. So just a couple of things. Um, congratulations on the success of the Try It Day. I know it grows every year, and I, I know you get a lot of media attention, and, and it's wonderful. One of the things that you'd mentioned as an aside is you're at capacity. Is that due to a lack of coaches or lack of venues? Um, so there's many at capacity questions. So are you talking about our sport organizations that are at capacity or this, the well, sport just, connection? Well, you just referenced that you were at capacity, and I just wanted clarification. Oh, at oh. Try It Day. Oh, no, no. Oh. Uh, well, I guess... No, it's separate. So Try It okay. Day, I'm assuming that you've got lots going on. Yeah. More of the after-school programs. The after-school programs, yeah. So I, I did refer to being at capacity for our school system. So COVID was really hard on our, our teachers, as I'm sure everybody is well aware. Um, our teachers historically have been expected to do volunteer work after, after hours, taking away time from their family to run any type of extracurricular programming. And there are stars in our div school divisions for sure, but they're not always going to be there. So we need to find a formula that works, that we can marry community sport and the school divisions so that we can create a system that can offer um, access to, to high quality, low barrier sport. So that, that's the piece that we're trying to figure out. Um, we're already learning a lot from what we did with the YQ and certainly would make some changes, but, but it's hard for our, our schools to say, hey, we need a coach. A lot of times they simply do not run their basketball program because there's nobody that's willing to coach. And for those of you that are in the sports system, you understand that it's harder to coach nowadays, right? So for a parent to step up and put their hands up, it takes a lot of courage these days because unfortunately in social media, everybody thinks that they have access to the coaches and everybody thinks that they know exactly what they should be doing and what is right for their child. So before that was fine because they could just yip in the background in the gymnasium but now, unfortunately, people are getting it, you know, through social media and things like that. So there's a lot of pieces that need 
that need support and leveraging. And certainly the school piece is one that we believe is a major part of that solution. Okay, thanks. And Chair Thiessen, one more if I may? Uh, sure. Okay. So the, the next one you'd mentioned was around transportation. And, and during the previous election, I'd read a report from the city where parents had cited the number one challenge to getting their kids into sport was transportation. Uh, now, I don't know what that looks like. I assumed it's two parents, both working, running two different kids or three different kids to various organizations. Um, is that accurate from your experience or is it something within the school system or, or Grand Prairie Public Transit? So, excuse me, that is not um, unique. So if you read provincial reports and you read national reports and you read international reports, it is not unique to hear that. It is absolutely a, um, a barrier for some. So that's why, that's another reason why the school system plays a major role in this because after school programming, there are going to be some that will need to be, um, won't be able to participate certainly because they need that bus ride after home safety. But some can walk home. Right, so we do still need that programming, and we do still. But it's easiest for that. So some kids can walk home, but they can't. Let's say go to a major center, right? Their parents can't take them to major. So that's a piece of the picture. Transportation is the biggest cost for our uh, school sport programming for them to do anything. Definitely, it's the biggest inhibitive inhibitor for them. Okay, thank you both. Thank you for those questions, Councillor Berg. I have a pretty loaded queue right now. I'm going to go to Coach Dillon first. <laughs> awesome. Well, well, thanks for your presentation. Thanks for your work. Uh, my family got to benefit from YQU. I had a grade four kid in it, and maybe I got the benefit of being, I don't know if I was one of the first, but I was one of the parents got a, got a phone call <laughs> on some social issues there. And it was actually interesting. I, it really actually did change the dynamic in my kid's entire class having these having this sport participation after school and getting to burn off steam and getting to figure out things you figure out on the sports court. And so right. I got to see it change. It was good for my kid. My kid enjoyed it, but I got to see it really change an entire class. So thank you for that. Uh, a question I've got is a concern I've had coming out of COVID is people just aren't in the habit of volunteering because they haven't had opportunities to volunteer mm -hmm. in the last couple of years as we're open again. And as sports are fully going again, what's locally, how are we doing at getting coaches and other key volunteers back into volunteering? So I haven't done any, I only have anecdotal, anecdotal um, reports on that. It, it is a challenge because of behavior change, certainly. Some organizations have been struggling. Some of our organizations have actually onboarded quite a few new coaches. Um, I believe that uh, we're going to see, or we need to see a formula that pays coaches. So when we're talking about a uh, college student or whatever, 20, I'm not saying a professional coach, but I'm saying, and that's what we're doing the YQU Sport for All. We're actually paying our coaches $20 an hour, right? So that they can put gas in their car or whatever. But also their experience with coaching starts that fire. Because coaching is really rewarding when you do it well. But we need... In order for people to catch fire, they need to be there in the first place. So yeah, there is issues. There are pockets where people are still struggling, certainly not, not only membership, but finding volunteers. But that has been, even before COVID, right? That has been increasing significantly. But so we need to find new solutions for that. I don't think volunteerism from the coach perspective is really the answer for, for sport. I think if we want to create stronger sports system, we need to really value it. And that means demanding higher quality of coaching. And so that can go on to another thing, but I hope that answered and Lee wants to spend some time. Just, uh, I'm pretty fortunate. I've each coaching courses throughout Alberta and often we have people from across the country as well. And one of the big challenges that we have that I think is gonna really impact the sports system in the coming years is that coaches are expected to be so much more now. You can't just go teach a layup. You know, you have to, there's so much emphasis now on creating a safe, inclusive environment. And so coaches have to 
the uh, where mental health and emotional health and uh, in addition to the physical safety. And it's much more daunting to be a coach these days, um, very much more daunting. And, and I think that's going to be a challenge for us to find coaches in the community, not just our community, but all across Canada because of the change of environment. And it's great that, you know, kids need to be safe, but uh, there's a lot piled on coaches in terms of taking courses. You know, you used to be able to volunteer your time. Now to coach, you've got to take a number of courses uh, of training and, and that sort of thing. But uh, it's something we're going to have to face. And, you know, I, I hope that as a sport connection, we can help be part of the solution. But but it is um, way more difficult to coach these days. Thank you very much for those answers. Thanks for the, the question, Coach Bressy. Uh, I know that as our COVID barriers have dropped, uh, it's becoming more and more important that we get high quality coaches and good people like guiding our kids because it seems like every program and every space is starting to fill up as people are well, getting yeah. their freedom back like man, to go yeah. and do what they want to do. So so uh, it's something, a good philosophical, philosophical conversation that we should continue to have and try to work out solutions as we move forward. So thanks for the question. Thanks for your answer. And thanks for your own questions in regards to that matter. Okay, so I have a full queue. I have Councillor Bosch, Councillor Laners, Mayor Clayton, in that order. Thank you, Chair Thiessen. Uh Thank you for coming. You have a great team. So I appreciate what you do. Um, just a couple comments and then one question, because I probably should know this. I don't know why I don't, but you know. Um, the Try It Day, what is unique to me is it's not just the large organizations who are through sport that you know we're all aware of. It's these unique smaller organizations that get involved that bring attention to new sport mm -hmm. or sport that needs to grow in our community. So I think for me, the Try It Day is um, exceptional in that respect. Uh, because everybody knows football, volleyball, hockey. It's these, you know, archery and, you know, disc golf and things that are unique to our community that that inclusion piece mm -hmm. uh, for people who may not want to do the large organization sports. Um, I can't remember my other comment. Uh, oh, sporting, uh, coaching. Um, my kids, I have three kids highly involved in sport their whole lives. To me, those are your your next team leaders, mm -hmm. right? And so I, I do see the value in maybe some sort of coaching opportunities for, for the kids who are involved in sport because in a second they would coach mm -hmm. because they've lived it their entire life. So I look forward to seeing, you know, some of these kids who are growing up getting involved. Um, but my question is, and I, the busing, mm -hmm. who is paying for that now? Uh, for the YKU Sport for All, it's actually part of the grant that I applied for. Recogni I recognized the barrier before applying for the grant, and it was part of the, it was piece of that solution. But other than that, nobody's paying for it. So um, our schools, and it depends on their principal, have allocated budgets, um, and some have larger budgets depending on the principal and how much the principal values sport within the school system. With the busing, are they using their, their large buses or is there smaller units that people are using? Yeah, so for the YKU, we're using the big yellow buses and that's generally what the schools do. They use the first choice busing or first student busing is what the line is called. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Laners. Well, great job. Um, big fan of sports. I, I really do, as a, obviously, with on the school board for years and years. I've seen what the impact that um, sport does for kids and builds that discipline and that character and that hard work and high expectations and everything that we want as, as citizens. So I think that's a great idea. And I think you did a great job. You have two things going for you. You have a great sales pitch and you had another notion that said, I got to get at those tables because otherwise they forget about us in Grand Prairie. So when I hear those two things, it just it smells to me like you know, you've got something that's, I don't know if they're, they're doing this everywhere, but... Uh, you've got something that can be sold and something that's worthy of funding. So my my point is, is um, uh, every time I watch these um, Edmonton Oilers games and I see the million dollar 50-50 draws and I see your cause as being as good if not better than than anyone else's and, it, and you know it, it sells and it smells good and it's right down their alley. So have you considered 
um, putting your name in and that to try and get some funding so that maybe you can pay for these buses and these coaches and these other things and and sell it and then kind of create the higher profile of your job. I don't know how even how that happens, but um, I think it's, the numbers are staggering. So um, maybe you might want to consider that if you haven't already. The numbers are staggering. We are going to see a bit of that money coming up through because they've allocated two million of that money, Hockey Alberta, to um, rural building rural hockey and things like that. So Grant, the region is going to see some of that money. If we can apply for something, we would and we could, but recognizing that we are limited at capacity. So it's myself and another employee. So um, there are a lot of initiatives and there's a lot of work to do. So we, there's a lot of we coulds, but um, we're capped and limited by the amount of time in a year. So we, this, even the YQU uh, you know, has added to our annual events um, right with the capacity and now we're taking on a multi-sport Swap. So it, we're all it's always a balancing act. But we, what we will be doing and what we constantly do um, is f take those grants, recognize those grants, and like remember conversations within the community. So one of our jobs is to be like, oh, well, fast pitch, I know that you guys are building right now. Here's a grant. Consider applying for it. If you need a second set of eyes, we're here to help. So we make those connections as well. So it's not only us. What we're doing is leveraging the good work that's already happening out there because we've got a whole army of volunteers that are already working and bringing in money. They just need, to, they're so busy, they don't see it. So those grant opportunities need to be communicated to them. And sometimes, you know, like, constantly over and over again because they're busy. Uh, sport volunteers, you guys, I bet you 80% of you guys have been sport volunteers. They're doing it all, plus they're working full time. So. That's, that's a good idea on the, uh, the Oilers thing. Uh, we might even partner with other sport councils around the province to, to do it. I think that's worth exploring for sure. Yeah, I, I think they recognize that it's not, their fan base is not just in Edmonton and yeah. that, hence the $2 million, but I think if they were to you know, explore other opportunities in the area, it looks good for them. You've got a great program. I think it's a good fit. They can only say no, but you know that's one way of building capacity. You don't have to do it all yourself, Karen. You can, yeah. you know, if you have money, you can you can do different things if that's if that's yeah. what you know in your world, your board decides, right? So anyway, something to consider. I know I I don't buy them very often, but I'd buy those 50-50 tickets for sure. So yeah, I know somebody that won it. So yeah, it's totally within your grasp. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Councilor Langers. In fact, my brother won one of those Oilers 50-50s. Yeah, 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 700000 in his pocket. What? Lucky guy, yeah. So it can be a good thing. I'm not sure if John Laner's idea came from my outfit today, but uh, I know he's a big Oilers fan, too. He's probably always spying in those 50-50s. All right, I got Councilor Clay or Mayor Clayton, sorry, and Councilor O'Toole next. No, you're, you're waving off. Okay, Councilor Blackmore after. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, thanks for the update. Appreciate that. I'm curious on the after school program because I haven't heard much of it until now. Um, how much of your operational time is this taking? Is this your main focus now? You say you're at capacity. Uh, sort of how, where's your role in this? So the uh, our role was setting it up. So organizing it, putting together registrations, working with the schools. Um, we had a com we have a committee um, through the board that uh, put together the lesson plans and things like that. Had a meeting, but the coaches are running it now. The first um, session, the intention was that our coaches that we had onboarded and trained would run it, but um, uh, for different varying reasons that nobody can predict. You know, s some coach can show up, so I would be running in. And I didn't anticipate this, but this is a learning curve, right, for us to recognize long term. So I did spend more time on it than anticipated. But right now we've got eight coaches, and we're we're running it, and um, you know they'll be t they'll be coaching this afternoon. I don't have to worry about it. We go in and we do interviews with the kids and the coaches, and we do um, pictures. And other than that, I'm going to do all, of course the follow up and then the report follow up. So. So I, I believe that as far as it has increased our workload, but it doesn't right now from my day-to-day -day operations, now that we're running it, it doesn't take a lot. So it d depends on different times. And the funding, the grant funding was one time, I'm assuming? The grant funding is one time with an opportunity to submit a, um, uh, a pitch for another $50,000. Okay. And so is this something unique to Grand Prairie? Are other sport connections doing something similar? 
Yeah, um, no, the sport councils aren't, and all of our sport councils in Alberta run with a slightly different mandates because we have different community needs. Um, but there is a program that r gets run out of um, Edmonton, which is very similar that I'm actually um, inspired by. It's called um, Free Play, and it used to be called Free Footy, for those of you that are familiar with it. And it's um, a really well-oiled machine, and they offer um, underserved youth opportunities into multi-sport and it includes transportation and free play as well and they've had um, you know their KPIs from that program have been significant with reports back from the families and the schools and things like that they are funded eventually by sponsorship so I believe that I know that we have um, uh, within our schools some schools do have um, parent groups that do fundraising for sports or culture or, or whatever they do I believe that there may be an opportunity role to leverage what they're doing and try to connect them with more funding or funding opportunities to actually create this program and pay for the coaches and continue to offer the kids free programming. We just need to run something successfully first, find a formula that actually works so that the parents have success or these groups have success the first time so they can repeat it. So we're just trying to our role right now is to create something that doesn't exist within our region that we're hoping we can sell. And then this free play is all run through sponsorship and donations. And I believe that there are, there are businesses in our region and it's a sellable product. Just like that's how we run Try It Day is we use sponsorship and to offset the, any of the costs from Try It Day and in partnerships with yourselves. I think that this is a sellable product. So if we can figure this out within the school divisions, you know, we can start looking at getting money into those those parent groups, and that's the overall objective. Uh, and so, tar sorry, tell me, um, when the board makes decisions to sort of pivot to other operational um, entities, um, is this through a strat planning process annually? Where, when when does this take place? Uh, yes, the strat plan happens in September when they, they figured this out. So this is um, still within the operational because in our, in our um, strategic outline, one of the goals is to create, um, one of our objectives is to create partnerships with the school boards. So that was this piece. And another one is ed education for more coaches within the community. And that was the 18 coaches piece, part of that. Right. The programming we've never done before, but the programming as part of the system just lever just helped create, s fill a gap that already wasn't there, which is increased participation, which is our overall goal as an organization is to enhance the growth and um, growth of sport within the region. So it did fall within it. It did add to our our um, our operational workload for sure. Um, but I think long term, if we can create a formula that works and hand it off, I think it's well worth the time. And, and our board has been great. They've, we've got a com committee with the board that's been working with it and with the school division. And uh, I had a last, another question, but I'll let someone else jump in. Thanks. Okay, I'll uh, jump over. Thank you for that, uh, Mayor Clayton. I'll jump over to Councillor Blackmore. She might have the same question, who knows, but then I'll come right back to you. Councillor Blackmore. Ms. Garnchild, on, uh, on your community group funding annual report, you uh, list the city of Grand Prairie at 108,000, uh, and then you have government other municipal at 56,000. Does that include the $50,000 government grant you're getting? No, so um, the the grant from the Make a Diff was 35,000. 56,000 comes from the um, county of GP. So we're funded, our operational funding goes, uh, is from the city at 108,000 and 56,000 from the county. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Thanks for the question, Councillor Blackmore. Mayor Clayton. Thanks for that. Um, back to the uh, after school program. Tell me, my kids are too old, so I don't know anymore. Is there still a YWCA program after school at some? Schools? YMCA, yeah. YMCA? You betcha, yeah. It's, so um, how is this not competitive with that? So the YMCA is a uh, babysitting. So they, as far as building physical literacy and sport development, that's not a piece of it. My kid is a YMCA kid. It's, it's, you go, they do have access to the gyms at times, but there's no actual organized programming that's involved there. Okay, thanks. 
Awesome. Thank you very much, Mayor Clayton. Uh, looking around. Wow, you guys really held your own there uh, as far as the line of questioning. A lot of good work that uh, you highlighted for us and uh, a lot of further work uh, through the questions and stuff. Uh, I know sport has developed incredibly over the last uh, 12 years here in the community of Grand Prairie, both for free access to sports such as disc golf, like Coach Dillon's pumping up, or even our bike track and skills park that uh, are setting up as well as the organized sports programming. So thank you for all the hard work that you do in connecting youth and people to sports in our community. And uh, thanks for uh, taking the line of fire questions and handling them so well. Appreciate your time here today. Thank you, everybody. Thanks to all of you for your recognition of the value of sport and for your financial support as well. So thank you. It's good work that you do. Thank you very much, Mr. Goldie. Thank you very much, Ms. Germscheid. Right, so delegation business out of the way here now. Uh, I will turn the, the cameras over towards our Director of Community Services, Mr. Arlen Miller, for his Director's Update. All right, uh, thanks Chair Thiessen. Uh, so I'll start off with Community Knowledge Campus. So the synthetic field in Grandstand is, Grandstand is now open for user groups and uh, they've begun practicing in the, the outdoor space even though it's a little bit cool yet. And uh, events and entertainment tickets are now on sale for Three Days Grace, announced at uh, the Bose Center, and uh, that'll take place on November November 14th. The Prospects Hockey Camp this weekend uh, is taking place at Bennett's Energy Center. And then the ice will be removed at Bennett's uh, beginning on May 2nd. The new boards and glass will be installed uh, beginning June 7th. And then with facilities, they're just beginning uh, scheduling startups for approximately 20 different seasonal sites such as the spray decks, the bear paw, golf course, sandy dumps, amphitheater, and uh, park shops. And then uh, they're also scheduling, uh, well, it, it began yesterday, the third floor renovations at City Hall. So you may hear some noise, but uh, HWD uh, contracting is upstairs. It should take about two months to renovate the third floor, and that'll create more uh, usable space for our staff. And then with Fleet, they're currently preparing the paving equipment for the upcoming season including uh, converting two sander trucks to asphalt hauling. So hopefully we don't get any more snow and uh, ice on the roads. Otherwise, Mr. Glavin will have to figure it out, I guess. <laughs> and then uh, with sports development, wellness and culture, with the activity center, the drop-in schedule has expanded. Uh, now that seasonal rentals have ended, allowing more times for, for drop-ins at the center. And then uh, on April 16th, the city hosted its annual Easter egg uh, event at Heritage Village. We had about 600 children attend the event, so that was good news. With HDC, the exhibit opening, there was 140 people approximately that, that attended. It was the $10 and a Dream exhibit that opened up on April 21st. Carbon Hackstad is the guest curator, and the exhibit features works by local artists, including Tim Heimdall, Suzanne Sanbo, Jim Stokes, and also uh, Carmen, of course. And then with transit, we are continuing to see uh, ridership increase, which is good news. And then uh, there was approximately 55, or sorry, a total of 55 clients who took advantage of the free trips that we offered and admission as well to the Philip J. Curry Museum. And that was over the, the last month or so. So that's my report, uh, Mr. Chair, unless there's any questions. Lots happening in, uh, in your portfolio there of your directorship. I'll look at uh, my other council members here for any questions. Ooh, you're getting off the hook, it looks like. All right, well, thanks for the update and the report and all the highlighting all the good work that we are doing in the city of Grand Prairie in arts, culture, and sport in our facilities. Uh, so moving right along then, since there are no questions, you're off the hot seat, Mr. Miller. I'm going to call to, to uh, I guess, our pre presentation space, uh, Mr. Uh, Charles Taves, Taws. Uh, to talk about the Municipal Historic Resource designation of one of our buildings here in the City of Grand Prairie. Welcome, Charles. Thank you, Chair Thiessen. And while you're setting up here, I'd just like to say thank you for the work that you did in helping with, uh, with the presentation, uh, $10 in a Dream, at the, at the Centre 2000 this past week uh, with Mr. Carmen Hackstead. Uh, it was nice to see you there and helping with curate that space in the King Gallery. Thank you. It was a uh, it was a really good collaboration. All right, you, the floor is yours, Mister. Okay. Well, thank you for asking me here today. Uh, I've brought the administrative report, which is uh, about the designation, the municipal heritage designation of the the old uh, Grand Prairie Courthouse, uh, known today as the Center of Creative Arts. 
Um, in the report, it, it lists the background uh, to this proposal. The city began a, a project of uh, creating a municipal heritage designation program uh, uh, in the early 2000s. About 2006, uh, an inventory was developed of heritage buildings in Grand Prairie, the city of Grand Prairie. 32 buildings were identified, of which those 32, 19 were seen as designation worthy. Um, there was a bit of a delay and from uh, that time, 2006, till it was reignited around 2018 when the Peace Country Historical Society uh, sent a letter to the city to ask what, what is happening. Uh, I was asked to uh, engage with the Historical Society. Mary Nutting and I, we went out and checked out all the, the properties that were identified in, in this uh, publication. And we found that about 15 were still um, worthy of designation and that they were still f intact as they were back then. Some are no longer with us, sadly, and some have been uh, modified, about five of them. Uh, it was thought that the, the old Grand Prairie Courthouse, the Centre for Creative Arts, would be a good place to restart this project because it is the only uh, city-owned facility that was on the, the final list of the 19 that was seen worthy as designation. David Leonard did create a, a statement of significance, which is in the report that outlines the historical uh, nature of this building. The building is um, a corporate style architecture, which, which makes it significant. It was very popular to be used in federal government buildings in the 1950s. Uh, it also is significant because of the role it played in the, the judicial history uh, of this area from its uh, opening in 1957 to about uh, 1985 when it closed. And uh, we recommend, the recommendation would be to, uh, uh, to designate the old courthouse as a municipal historic resource and to, to help and to start develop a process to manage municipal historic resources within the city. Awesome. Thank you very much, Mr. Taz. Uh, I'll look to my council and committee. I have Councillor Bosch uh, in the queue first and then Councillor Blackmore. Thank you Hi. for coming back today on this. My question to you is, um, do we know what, there was some discussion about maintenance and upkeep and perhaps the roof, things like that, uh, to be done in the future. And it says in this report that we may get gr provincial grants. Um, what if we don't? What is the backup plan? Uh, so if we, well, if we don't, there could be an increase in cost, yes. It's very hard to determine those because every situation is so different. Um, in terms of the old Grand Prairie Courthouse, the, the, the intent is to designate it for its appearance, its outward appearance. Uh, because much of the interior has been already altered. There's really uh, not, not much in there that I think could be, de could be part of the designation. So it's the overall appearance. So the, the roof portion and the roof could be included as, uh, as something we could apply for for a grant because it, it involves the integrity of the structure. But because it's not visible from the street level, it, it could probably, there's some leeway there. So every proposal for, for renovation, would, would, you'd work with a representative from the province to, um, to make sure it's done in a certain way. And everything would have to have the permission of the municipality as well in, in terms of renovations. So one of the things that, uh, about the building too, talking to um, the, the Center for Creative Arts is all the windows have been replaced. So all the windows have modern materials in them, but they kept the old uh, uh, division of the windows. They were divided into four. Each window was divided into four spaces, larger spaces at the top, smaller at the bottom. So it was interesting to see how they were able to sympathetically install new windows uh, that mimic the look of the old ones. So and, and the intent here isn't to preserve this building, we can't preserve it the way it is because there isn't enough left, but we want to preserve the overall appearance of the courthouse uh, because of that federal style of architecture. Um, my follow-up is, 
I absolutely support this this whole process. I'm just curious, is there someone that you can um, collaborate with from the government who could come and see this structure and, and see if um, there's significant costs in the future and potential for grants or not getting the grant, like you say, with the roof? Um, is there any help like that for you? Well, I do have a contact, Gary Chen, who comes up once a year, particularly for the Forbes House, which is a provincial historic resource. I could ask him. I, I don't know if he has the availability of time to do that, um, but it's, it's certainly something I could ask him. We, we did ask about the roof, and that's how we, we know about that it, it would be included because it's integral to the structure. Right. It's just, you know, all of us know that as soon as there's renovations or some sort of maintenance, surprises come. And I would hate to have any unwanted surprises that are overwhelming. There are in any old building lots of surprises. I agree. Yeah, we're used to that uh, here at the city of Grand Prairie. Uh, new and old, actually. Uh, but I have uh, Miss Bieberdorf in the queue. She had uh, maybe an additional uh, response to your question. Thank you, Chair Teason. We do have 115,000 already allocated this year for capital budget for the roof replacement. So if we do apply for grants, it could help offset some of the cost of that roof replacement as well. That's, that's great news. Uh, I think I have Councillor Blackmore next in the queue. I have a comment and then a question. Um, my comment is after reading the uh, criteria for a municipal designation as opposed to provincial designation, I would support this going forward. I'm not on this committee, but uh, in the long run, I would support this. My concerns when uh, we discussed this earlier was the provincial designation and can carry a lot of um, restrictions with it, where the municipal designation, I feel from what I read, and then I'll ask you, Mr. Hawes, to confirm, gives us much more flexibility on how we manage the building in the future. If it's designated municipally and the owner of the building wants to make a, a change, they need to get the approval of the municipality to make that change. And the municipality would work with the owner to, in many cases, the if there's a character defining element as to why the building was designated, there might be a better way to, to do the renovation so it's not affected. But we are the owner of the building. That's right. So in this case, it would be a little bit of a uh, easier to do, I, I would say. Um, if it becomes a provincially designated building, uh, then we're, you really have to meet up with the advisor and they use the standards and guidelines for the conservation of historic places in Canada. And, and those guidelines are, are really designed at preserving historic structures like the Forbes House. So it would be to, you know, number one, maintain what is there, or two, if you're going to replace it, say a windowsill, and it's a wooden windowsill, you make sure you replace it with wood, and not aluminum, that kind of thing. Yeah. So that's not a process that I would support, a provincial designation, but I like the municipal designation. I think that's good. Um, my next question is actually, I think, for administration. Uh, when the building was renovated, I don't know, uh, eight or nine years ago, when the windows were replaced, was the roof not done at that time? And um, there was an elevator put into the building? Does anyone know? I'm, I might be able to answer that for you, Councillor Blackmore. I was Vice President of the Centre for Creative Arts uh, from 2004 to 2007, at the same time that we undertook the big renovations on the inside. Uh, we worked side by side with the city and our architects, I think it was Conchetto, that helped us work with that as far as putting in the windows and maintaining the integrity of the building. I do believe there was a uh, roof patchwork that was part of that, but now we're getting on about 15 years since that original renovation was done. So uh, there's a possibility that it may be needed to be refurbished. Um, but uh, one thing I really liked about being part of the Centre for Creative Arts at that point uh, was the support that we had from the city and the support that we had to keep it as true to life as it was when it was originally erected in that building. Because uh, Grand Prairie simply I actually was surprised to hear that we had over 30 potential historically municipal designated sites and 15 to 16 that qualified. I thought we might have one or two and this would be one of those buildings. But uh, I know uh, Margie Beale, the executive director at the time, worked very hard to maintain that. As far as how the roof is weathering right now, um, 
like I said, it's been 15 years, so usually we have to do a bit of patchwork, but maybe Katie has the answer for that now. Thank you. I don't unfortunately have that information, but we can get it from facilities and provide it back to committee. Awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, does that help at least shine a little bit of light on it for you, Councillor Blackmore? My only concern is if we replaced the roof 15 years ago and it needs replacing now, uh, a roof should certainly last longer than 15 years. That's, that was my only um, question or concern. So, but I'll wait for an answer from administration at some other time for that, thanks. Well, another good resource that might that might be able to tap into would actually be the Center for Creative Arts. I know they keep everything on file for all the work that they did, and they were the ones that applied for all the grants and have all the blueprints. So might be a quick call to Candace Hook there and uh, might be able to get those answers quick, either through administration or through yourself, Councillor Blackmore. Um, any other questions? Oh, sorry, I forgot you were in the queue, Mr. Berg. Uh, oh. Councillor Berg. No, that's okay. It, it's more of a, a comment. Um, so with the Art Gallery of Grand Prairie, uh, Gary Chen worked on that, did a, a wonderful job. So that, again, you were asking about that, uh, Councillor Bosch. Um, now, one of the things, too, is, is we talk about what modifications can happen. And when you look at the front of that 1929 schoolhouse, you can obviously see modifications did happen. But the province was very willing to work with us on that. So yes, there were restrictions around it. Again, getting back to the windows. The windows had to match, although now they're, they're proper windows for our weather. So I just want to alleviate any fears on modifications. You can do things. You can work with the province or the city. Uh, it doesn't handcuff you. Uh, at the end of the day, the building has to be functional, but still true to what it, uh, what it looked like. Um, even today. Yeah, thank you for that comment, Councillor Berg. Uh, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, I think uh, our, our community, we have a, a great rich history of pioneers and, and stuff. We just don't have a great rich history of old buildings. It seemed like we went through a phase where we just started tearing everything down. And I like to, for me, history and culture are important in, in identity, especially of any community. So I see your hand was up there, yeah. Councillor Berg. So well if I if I can move it along, I'd actually like to make the motion, speak to it and then make the motion if that's please, okay. please do, my friend. Yeah. So when I do travel around, um, I appreciate and respect uh, the mature cities that have preserved its heritage and architecture. we we are still a very young city in relation to even Canada or the rest of the world at roughly hundred and ten years. So our, our amazing buildings that we do have, we, we should really start focusing in on, on preserving those. And we only have to look at our neighbors where the County of Grand Prairie has nine designated properties. Uh, Sexsmith has six designated properties. Uh, I think the city of Grand Prairie to this point has two. So we have some catching up to do and we have the buildings. And I think we have a, a council that's willing to start moving forward on that. So, so with that, I recommend council uh, consent to designating the old Grand Prairie Courthouse located at 9904 101st Avenue here in Grand Prairie as a municipal historic resource and direct administration to develop a process to manage municipal historic resources. All right, thank you very much for, for that motion. And it is in order as per the recommendation. And I'll look to any member of council or committee who wishes to discuss or have any questions. Seeing none, I'll call to question. And that carries unanimously. Thank you very much, Charles, for your presentation and all your hard work on this. I look forward to preserving this building going forward. Thank you very much. Have a glorious day, my friend. All right, so we have come pretty close to the end of our meeting here. Uh, I'm going to turn the camera back towards uh, Director Miller to go over our outstanding items list. Director Miller. Uh, thanks, Chair Thiessen. So just four items on the list. and. Uh, Number 1177 can be removed with uh, Mr. Tao's report today if council or if committee agrees to that. And otherwise, uh, everything else is on track as uh, expected to be. So. Thank you very much for that, uh, Director Miller. I'll scan for anybody who's not in agreement with that. And seeing none, I'll look for a motion to approve the outstanding items list as amended. Any one of you? Anyone? Oh, Mayor Clayton. <laughs> Mayor Clayton moves through silence. 
<laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, that is in progress. Councillor Bosch in favor, and that passes unanimously. Thank you very much, everyone, uh, for this meeting. We'll give about five minutes in between the next one or less, uh, and we'll see you soon. Thank you very much.